Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. We're very proud to present our first speaker, Graham Jensen with Coinbase. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Hey. Um, all right, cool. Uh, so I'm Graham. I'm from, uh, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase is a leading digital asset exchange. So that means that we uh, buy and sell uh, digital assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, it also means that we kind of move billions of dollars uh, of, of these assets. Uh, so security is actually kind of a big deal at Coinbase. Um, so today what I'm going to be talking about is just how we develop and deploy serverless applications using the application service model um, at Coinbase in this like security focused organization. Um, so I'm going to talk about like security and serverless and how we automate those. Um, I'm going to be giving some like tips and tricks just on like the AWS resources side of stuff. Um, and then we'll be talking about our open source uh, implementation of these ideas called Fenrir. Um, so kind of like what our developers want is they want to be able to take their idea. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Cool. So um, what, people, what developers want is they want to take their idea to production with like as little friction as possible. They want to they they want to get um, they want to feel productive and and again getting code out. Now, what security kind of wants to do is they want to uh, inject themselves throughout the software development lifecycle to like do things like sign off on code and configuration changes, make sure the application has like least privilege, make sure that there aren't any like obvious vulnerabilities or exploits available like in these things. And this kind of like tension at Coinbase between uh, being in like this high security. Um, area and and wanting to also make our developers happy is where a lot of autom automation and innovation is actually drives uh, is driven from. Um, just as like an ex example of like why Coinbase cares about security. Uh, so this is the uh, IC3 report from the FBI. It's actually uh, really uh, interesting to read. Um, in 2018, uh, based on like 350,000. Um, complaints uh, it says that 2.71 billion dollars were stolen on the internet. Um, this is actually probably a tiny fraction of the total amount. One, it has to be reported to the FBI, so it's probably uh, USA centric, so it doesn't look at the entire world. And yet, because it's self reported, not everyone is reporting it here. And another kind of data point that we can look at is this uh, thing called the blockchain graveyard, which is an aggregation of all of the hacks that have occurred against digital currency exchanges like Coinbase and an estimate of how much money is actually stolen from there. And just, just in that, there's like hundreds of millions of dollars. So Coinbase really doesn't want to be part of these statistics. There are bad people out there that are trying to break into our stuff, and we want to just make sure that we, that we are secure. So the State of DevOps um, report in 2018 found it had a key finding that automating security policy configuration is mission critical to reaching the highest levels of DevOps evolution. So basically they were saying like, it's a good idea to automate these, these security things, no matter how difficult it is, because it's much better to have, um, to, to find these vulnerabilities before stuff reaches to production than to try and like mitigate a production issue. And just this, this kind of makes common sense as well. Automation is like less error prone, it's, um, it's faster, and it also provides like developers with a good feedback so that they can actually fix their own problems rather than like having to set up a meeting with security and go through all of this friction that we're trying to avoid. And personally at Coinbase, uh, developers love us when we automate stuff. So that's kind of like uh, a lot of what um, I do there, which is just, hey, we have these security concerns, we're going to implement some automation and then make, make, to make sure that these, uh, cons uh, these security concerns never make it to production. So um, who here has used serverless? Is this like a serverless crowd? I don't know. So like serverless is just basically a, a bunch of different resources in AWS, like uh, Lambda and DynamoDB, S3, for example. And then this is made, and serverless is kind of like made easier to be used uh, using the AWS serverless application model, SAM, uh, which is just a template on top of CloudFormation. Who here has used CloudFormation? All right, cool, a bunch of people. So. Um, so Sam just actually is, is, what we want to do is provide to our developers a way for them to define their full stack applications in an easy and understandable way and then we can also automate. 
uh, automate our security configuration. So what we're trying to do is get uh, uh, write some code in between uh, our developers' SAM templates before it goes out and creates uh, like the, um, the DynamoDB, the Lambda, the API gateways, and all of that stuff is, is then powered by IAM. Now, where this code lives in anyone's hair system, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it has to like, like if you're doing it, in, if you're using Circle or Jenkins, you can just chuck it in there. Uh, for us, what we've done is we uh, use, uh, we put it inside of a step function and a Lambda, and we'll talk about that in a bit um, later. But the goal of this, of the, these checks, is to make sure that the template that the developer is trying to change or update or create is allowed, it works, and it, and it satisfies all of our security policies. So let's go over just some of like the general kind of security policy ideas that we're actually doing. So the, the, the first one is we don't let our developers name all of the resources. Otherwise, you end up with name conflicts and all sorts of other problems. So what we do is we prefix it with a bunch of invariant things. For instance, like the stage that you're deploying to, which we call a configuration or the project name, plus like a solid prefix. Because SAM templates are just YAML, and you can just convert YAML into JSON, and JSON comes with this wonderful uh, JSON schema uh, tool. What we do is we write a JSON schema to easily limit the types of resources that a, a developer can use, and even limit the particular properties and the features that they actually uh, can use in there. And then the next thing is we, we want to validate all the external resources, because every, everyone uh, can just create a, a SAM template and then reference any resource, uh, for instance, like security groups and IAM roles. What we want to do is actually go out and then look at all of the different, uh, look at these and make sure that a particular uh, developer launching a particular uh, project is actually allowed to use those security groups. And then finally, um, for audit purposes and for also like things like budgeting um, or uh, billing, we also want to just correctly tag all of those, all those things. Now, the, the first kind of like line, what's going on? Either, all right. The first line of defense of like a CloudFormation is the role in which it actually executes the CloudFormation template. Now, creating IAM roles, which a lot of like, developers want to do is super scary. Because if you can actually attach a policy or create a role, that means that that user can essentially escalate their own permissions and then is a pseudo user. So one way w which we, we stop that from happening is what we can do is we can say that a permissions boundary, uh, does everyone here understand, know what a permissions boundary is? I'll just go over it. Basically, it's a, it's, it's a strict set of rules that an IAM role um, can use. So for instance, you can say in a permissions boundary, you can de describe an EC2 instance, but you, um, and then you can deny any kind of like creating an EC2 instance. So what we can do with, um, is we can say to the CloudFormation that you can only create roles that have a particular permissions boundary attached. Uh, we can also limit the prefixed resource, uh, resources. Remember, we've prefixed all of the names. So that means that we can say to this CloudFormation role, you can only actually create resources of this particular name, and that becomes really useful, especially in audit purposing, to know where a particular resource came from and know that if, if it's prefixed with this, it had to have come through our security policy. And then last week, and it's limit the tags to make sure that um, CloudFormation can only create resources with tags. So the main thing is we want to also, uh, the stack name is also, uh, we want to make idempotent. We don't want to let um, our developers like name the stack. So again, we're going to use the invariance. We're going to use a prefix and a uh, project name and a staging name to actually name the stack. And that way, we can um, easily uh, run these cloud formation templates. So the first resource we're going to go over is the Lambda. So if you want to put a Lambda inside of a VPC, and you might want to do that for uh, to talk to like databases like RDS or something else, or you want to talk to internal services, you're going to have to attach a security group and a subnet. So one of the things you want to do is make sure that that security group is actually allowed to be used by this, this particular Lambda. And the way in which we do that is we go out and we look at the tags on that security group and we make sure that, that it has a project name tag that matches the particular Lambda and it has a staging tag which matches this particular Lambda. So at Coinbase, we kind of take this a step further. We, we actually have an individual security group per Lambda. 
And the, me and the reason of that is that we then get really tight um, like constraints on exactly what ingress and egress this particular Lambda can have. Also, just like the subnet, you probably don't want a developer launching a Lambda inside like a persistent subnet or like the same subnet as an RDS. Um, lambdas tend to also just hog ENIs, so your IP address range will like shrink very quickly. So it's sometimes a really good idea to launch um, uh, the, the, the Lambdas in, a, in their own dedicated subnet. Uh, one thing that Sam gives us as well, which is really nice, is the, um, the fact that defining the things that trigger the Lambda is super easy. So here you can see that you can just say, hey, I have this function, and I want it to be triggered by an SQSQ or, an a or like a particular API gateway. The problem is that you don't want a particular project to be able to look at any SQSQ. You don't, you don't want them to go out and then just be able to go, like, I want to listen to all SQSQs. So again, what we do is we validate that the SQSQ has the particular tags that actually allow this function to be used. And, again, and on the API gateway, we don't even want someone to be able to use an API gateway that was created outside of this particular stack. So inside of our security policy, what we do is we automate, we say that if you're going to uh, be triggered by a particular uh, API gateway, that API gateway has to be defined within the stack, the same stack. Uh, so when you're using Lambda, there's basically two ways in which you can use IAM. So every Lambda has to have an IAM role attached. And if you're using SAM, there's basically two ways. One, you can reuse a role that already exists. And like, and like I've been talking about, what we do is we go out and make sure that the Lambda is actually allowed to use that role. Otherwise, they'll, someone might just go like, hey, sudo works for me, so I'm just going to attach, su attach sudo. So what we do is we go, hey, does this particular role have a, um, the project name and the staging name actually connected to allow the user to... Um, the, allow the developer to use that role on their Lambda. Um, and the other way in which uh, you can use this is you can actually uh, ask Sam to create uh, its own role for you. And you can use this, and it's wonderful, these policy templates are actually a really good, cool feature of Sam. So you can say, uh, because it, it means that you don't have to ask your developers to learn how to write an IAM policy, they can just use this template. Hey, I want to be able to actually like, uh, like create and update records inside of a DynamoDB. So you can just say, all right, use the DynamoDB CRUDs policy. And then it also makes it easier on the security policy side because we don't need to like uh, um, implement a security policy against all of IAM potential. We can just implement it against these specific policy templates. So we can say, hey, you can only use a DynamoDB table with this policy if that DynamoDB table was created in the same SAM stack. Hey, you can only use this KMS decrypt policy if that KMS key actually has the correct tags. And that way, we can enable our developers to create IAM roles um, what is it, securely, that satisfy us. Also, we inject this permissions boundary thing at the top because it would just fail if that permissions boundary wasn't there because the, the CloudFormation stack can't create a role without that permissions boundary. Um, if anyone here has used CloudFormation, I'm sure you've all probably changed the name of a database and it just dies. It gets deleted and then, re and then recreated as a new one and you lost all of your previous data. That happens because deletion policy's default is actually to delete the resource. So one of the nice things about the security policies is we can clean up a lot of these, like, um, these uh, bad defaults and we can actually just say, hey, if you change the name of this, retain it. If anything, for audit purposes, or maybe it was a mistake and we can roll it back. Or like the best option there is actually just to fail if someone tries to uh, delete. So we also have an uh, API gateway. Um, another talking of bad defaults, the default endpoint configuration for an API gateway is public. That means that if you don't explicitly state that it's going to be private, your API gateway will be open to the world. So what we do is we actually change that default to be private so that if you're launching in like development or an internal API gateway, it won't be open access to everyone. And we also want to make sure, and, and we actually enforce that to be private in certain AWS accounts, for instance, development accounts. There's no reason why an API gateway should be public inside of the development account. And then, of course, you also want to implement this like nifty little thing down here, this X Amazon API gateway policy, which is a really good idea. It lets, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like a pseudo policy that, uh, that lets things in and out. Um, now the problem is that if you have a Lambda that wants to be accessible by 50 VPCs, the normal way is you'd need a different statement for every single VPC. That means that, you need, that, means that 
you would need 50 different statements. This is actually just a little trick that I thought was quite fun. So like the idea is that you can actually just allow star to allow everything to call this API gateway, and then you can do a double negative and say, I want to deny string not equals to a list of VPCs, which is actually just like much easier. So instead of having, so if we have like a centralized Lambda that needs to be accessible by you know, 100 VPCs across 100 accounts, we have two statements rather than 100 statements, and it makes the same template just look much nicer. Yeah, so now I'm going to talk about a bit about Fenrir. So Fenrir is our internal implementation of these ideas. Uh, Fenrir sits in between our developers and the cloud, and it, it goes out and actually um, validates what uh, the, the validates the same template that the developer is asking it to deploy. Um, so it's a step function, and it's a uh, with with a single lambda. This is what the step function looks like. You can see at the very top, it just like validates everything, and then it locks it so that you can't do two deploys at the same time because that would break everything. And then after that, it's actually just a re-implementation of the AWS SAM deploy script, which you usually run locally, but in a serverless manner. So that means that Fenrir is a self-service, serverless AWS SAM deployer. So that's, yeah. I wanted to call the talk that, but AWS wouldn't let me. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that. So, like, bring it back to, like, the original kind of, like, statement. You want to automate security policies because it's easier and it helps developers. So this is all of the stuff that, that Fenrir actually looks at just for Lambda, right? And this is open source, by the way, so you can go to github.com slash Coinbase slash Fenrir and then go have a look at this and how we do it. You can imagine in a world where there's a security team member on every single configuration change having this list and going through and manually checking every single one of these things, right? That is a ton of friction. Imagine just going through and, and like saying, oh, I want to listen to five SQSQs and then manually checking every one of those. And how horrible an experience that would be for actual developers and your security team. So putting this kind of like middle person in the way to actually validate security policies has, has made like developers at Coinbase much happier and also security happier because everything is like absolutely like following the security policy because it's in code, it's explicit. And another thing is that like, if, say, a developer has one of these things wrong, Fenrir will actually return an, a useful error message so that the developer can unblock themselves. Because what we want is security outside of um, implemented and automated, and the developer to have the self-service experience of serverless so that they can actually feel productive and move their code to production. So this is just a bunch of links. Um, uh, GoFormation, um, which is the AWS Labs project, which Fenrir is based on. Uh, Step, which is our uh, uh, Step function um, framework. Um, and then there's just a bunch of, uh, uh, like, all the data points that I mentioned before. Uh, thank you. That's basically the end of my talk. I'll be at the bar if anyone has any questions.